No, 2008. 2008? Oh, yeah. sure, my bad. Um, and uh, he practices up in Marin, and uh, he is also a really good friend of mine. So without further ado, please help me welcome Dr. Ian Davis Tremaine. I recognize most of you, so that's awesome. I can take that. Um, this is Christina. Christina is my CA. And she is also going to be a LifeWest student in October. Yeah. So our office is like breeding ground for new docs. So that's pretty cool. And, and come on, keep it all right. Yeah, just keep it all right. <laughs> so uh, I have no topic, so that's cool. Um, I never do. And I figure that we'll kind of just open it up for a full-on discussion. I know some people I asked online what we should talk about today is so we're going to talk about technical stuff, like Jordan want to talk about technical x-ray or something. So you guys probably get a lot of philosophy and uh, stories about how amazing the docs are that stand up here and talk about their life and stuff. Yeah, already? Cool. Um, <laughs> this is important to me. I don't know how re relevant it is. Yes. But um, it appears that you have tattoos in your forearm, then these are the tattoos that your patients see uh, before and after your impulse that you deliver to the brain stem. Yeah. Could you share with share with us uh, what one of the tattoos means and what your intent is while you put in your Yeah, I mean if I went through every tattoo it'd probably be the whole hour. So I'm lying. <laughs> I take off my shirt it looks like I have a shirt on. Right? <laughs> but every tattoo that I have represents something I love. Mainly my family and being sober and music. That's kind of everything that's in here. So briefly though, like this is the family crest for my son's name, Corbin. Memento morte means remember you will die, so stay humble. A raven, Corbin means raven. Uh, a rose is like eternal love. This is my wife's uh, anniversary, our wedding anniversary. My mom, you know. Uh, Nirvana and Cesticide is my favorite Nirvana album. <laughs> I got Jane Doe, she's some verge up here. I got a lot, man. But the truth is that when I first started in practice, I wore a tie and sleeves all the way down, you know, so no one knew that I had tattoos, they just knew I had piercings. And I was really worried people would judge me. And I'd say my practice took off when I started to become more comfortable with myself. And I started showing tattoos, not caring. And really, no one cares, right? I no. mean, no one brings it up. I think I've had one person who's uncomfortable with it, and that was recent. And she didn't start care with us, and we kind of knew that that was probably why. But I think I'm, that's probably more personality than my tattoos. Um, in order to be delivering the most proficient thrusts and take away the interference, not the adjustment to take over with an ache, I think you have to be as comfortable as possible in your skin. Like literally, my body is my temple. So I take care of it, I decorate it, I eat vegan. Uh, no weird stuff coming in, right? What's pretty important though is in my world is music. So in my office, I play whatever music makes me feel good that day. So today's Monday and I had morning metal going on. We had some students, are they here yet? I don't think they got here yet. We had some students there earlier who we were playing Gojira actually in my office, which is like hardcore metal band. Uh, sometimes reggae, you know, it doesn't really matter. You gotta express yourself. But most people are most comfortable with you when you're comfortable with yourself. So I don't do a tie. In fact, I wear polos a lot, and I'm like, I'm, like I said, I'm covered, right? So, I answer that. Absolutely. Cool. Yeah, I'd say that like in practice, the most important thing for me is that I, I'm just me. You know, I don't mess around. I swear a lot, because that's how I am. <laughs> and I'm really trying not to, because I have a kid now. Uh, most people come into me and they, they have an issue or a problem and I make them feel like they're just part of my family. And they tend to forget about the problem because we don't care about their symptoms, right? We're just taking care of that cost. So, yeah, you just gotta be you. If you're not you, then what's the point? It's not fun. You gotta make it fun. Think about this, is that every time that you have a day in practice, like we, sometimes we see Hey. So, <laughs> sometimes we, we see like 50 something people, sometimes it's 30 something, but whatever it is, either way you're taking on, let's say 40 to 50 people's shit. 
right? They're like dumping their stuff on you every day. And if you're not comfortable in your skin, and if you feel like, like that's too heavy for you, it's probably because you're not allowing yourself to express yourself because you're already buckled in. So I have to be in the most comfortable environment possible for myself before I can take anyone on. So you haven't been to our practice, have you? For, for you that have been to our practice, our practice is pretty awesome, I gotta say. I love it. Um, but we designed it, my wife and I designed it so we feel comfortable like we're in a zen environment. So when you first walk in, I want you to already feel like you're healing just by walking in the door. That was really important to us. I didn't want to have a white wall. I didn't want to have like X, like spinal x-ray crap all over the walls. Like there's nothing chiropractic about our office besides us. And that's really important to me. Because I don't feel good when I go to the chiropractic office to get adjusted. I'm looking at spinal decay. Right? That sucks. <laughs> it really does. I think it's gross when people have that stuff on you. That's all just scare shit. It's all scare tactics. When you do scare tactics, you're no longer delivering, you know, the power of upper cervical. Because what is the purpose of upper cervical? Neurology. What? Neurology. Neurology. Why are we delivering a thrust? Are we doing it to make someone feel better? No. Not at all, right? Honestly, I could kind of care less how someone feels. My job is to remove the interference, take care of the cause, let the symptoms take care of themselves, right? Sometimes they get worse, sometimes they get better symptomatically. But the last thing I want someone to do is walk into our office and feel pressured and like, oh, I have to do this care because I might die. I might be paralyzed. Like that, that doesn't feel very good. I want people to do care because they know it's the best option for them. And they've been having something that's been happening for years and years and years. And now we get a very short amount of time to fix it by addressing the cause, not just treating the low back pain. That's a very minimalistic way of looking at life, just by fixing one symptom. And everyone who walks in your door is going to come in with symptoms. That's just the reality of it. Now it's your job to re-educate them to understand that it's the cause that we're focusing on, not the neck pain, not their insomnia, not their MS. These aren't the things that we're treating. All we're doing is removing subluxation. Yeah? Yeah, two things. So, first of all, speaking about people coming in with a lot of stuff, mm -hmm. um, my understanding is that the, the chest, um, though it's really powerful, it's pretty intense. Mm -hmm. um, so let's say, uh, for example, you have somebody who comes in with um, kind of has anxiety about that, maybe they had some, some trauma. And, so that happens a lot, actually. Yeah. So how do you like work around that? you modify your technique? Somewhat. So there's different ways of doing knee chest, which kind of sounds weird, but it's true. And there's kind of different camps of how you do it. Um, we do something called, called kale. Kale knee chest. Kale knee chest is the idea of your, your it's, it's like EJ Palmer, really. It's like a toggle, almost. You're in and you're out as quick as possible, and you let a knee take over. You never stick the bone, you never force it to happen. You try to kind of find the window of, of ease within the patient or the client to remove the interference. So that's one thing. So our adjustment's not as heavy as what it looks like. Actually, it looks more intense than it looks. Um, but there are those times that it is intense. Some people will start in a sideline position. So we're not doing knee chest. We're doing more like a solid headpiece toggle. We'll start there. Um, it's a little less intense if you feel more comfortable because your head's not turned. And then other people, if they really, really have an issue, like we have this one lady, Debbie, who's uh, really interesting. And uh, she can only handle the activator. So we use an activator instead of my hands. I probably have two or three people like that out of all the people I see. Um, most people use the sideline position on, though, or people who can't turn their head properly can't get on their knees. But yeah, so we modify, but my point is to build it up to where they can handle full adjustment. But like I said, our adjustment's actually a lot easier than it looks. Second question is, uh, what do you think about using other techniques to help facilitate the nervous system's um, kind of release after the like training and all of it? Yeah, so actually we have network people in our county who uh, we are close with. I take all their x-rays for them. 
and we do co-manage some people. When we co-manage, though, um, I make sure it's with someone who's not going to be really adjusting the spine or putting thrust in the spine. I do it with someone who does more like DGI or network. Um, I think that's great if people need that. Um, once again, those are those are uh, out of chiropractic techniques. Those aren't truly technical. Like, well, BGI is an analysis, not a technique, number one. The second is that network is actually not chiropractic. It, it's not, I mean, it's network is technically an analysis, too. We're not doing an actual thrust to the spine. So you're in training them as opposed to adjusting them, right? So, you so it's your company. Yeah, totally. Um, but it, I think it's the same as someone getting massage and so getting chiropractic. You know, it's like it's just another add-on. If that's okay, then you need that. That's fine. But for me, it doesn't change anything I do. You know, and some people I will tell them not to do it. Like, just hold off for a while. Let's just focus on this. Because how do you know what's working or not? If you're doing a shotgun method, if you're doing everything at once, then you're like, oh crap, but which one worked, right? But for us, we have to scan. The scan is really important because that tells us if we remove the interference or not. That's all I care about. Right? And some people, they won't hold their adjustments because they're doing other techniques. Would it be possible for you to share with us a bit of your elevator pitch? A lot of us are working on how to communicate chiropractic to people who are non familiar, and it'd be interesting to see our upper cervical elevator. From an upper cervical perspective. Okay. Um, sure. Hey, how you doing? What do you do? Hey, Josh. <laughs> I'm a brain stem specialist. Oh, that's really no, I don't do that. <laughs> I got I got over the whole like let's try to like separate upper cervical from chiropractic. So what I pretty much say is like we're chiropractors but very specialized. We focus on two bones in the neck, the C1 and C2, or the atlas and the axis. Inside of that is where the brain stem sits. So the brain stem is housed by the by the atlas or axis. If one of those bones is out of place, Meaning it can be twisted, torqued, pushed off the one side or the other. It's going to put pressure or interfere with the brainstem. The brainstem controls everything automatic in your body. So whatever you're not thinking about doing, it's doing for you. So if we can remove that interference and let that part of the brain reestablish itself and recalibrate, then we're going to let the body take over itself and heal on its own so we don't have to do anything else. We're not here to treat your low back pain. We're right here to treat your neck pain. I'm more important, or more interested in relieving the pressure off the brainstem. Simple as that. If they really want to know more about it, I can get really technical. Um, in reality, it's really not pressure on the brainstem. Like that's not what we're really looking at. But for their purpose, that makes more sense. Pressure, you know. That's kind of how I explain it. Yeah. Can you explain the neurology behind the the what, sorry? The neurology behind the scan. Yeah, so the scan's really important. So this, the, we do a thermal scan. Thermal scan will show us how the brain stem's functioning. The scan reads deep emitted skin temperature. So temperature that's under the skin. It has two infrared beams to go in the skin and back out. As we're scanning them, it's going to give us a graph. That temperature is controlled by vasodilation and constriction of blood vessels, directly controlled by the brain stem. So if anything's interfering with the function of the brainstem, one side of the body is going to be hotter than the other side because it's imbalanced, meaning it has a lack of homeostasis. When we remove the interference, we can do a scan afterwards to make sure that there's balance of deep admitted skin temperature heat caused by the vasodilation and constriction of blood vessels controlled by the what? Brainstem. Bam. There you go. Does that help? You're ready to do that. I did research that. Um, that you can't do that with a room that has an open window or an air vent because it'll throw it off and you have to have the patient sit there with a hour. With a thermal couple, there's different types of scanners. A thermal couple is only reading superficial heat. Um, uh, Titron, which is digital infrared thermography, is reading temperature under the skin. So it shouldn't actually have any effect with the window and not, unless the person was sitting next to the window for a good 15, 30 minutes having just cold air on one side, which can definitely do that. So we have an environment in our office that's always a same, there's no like constant breeze on one side or the other, right? Or we'll pre-rest them for five minutes in a resting chair and let them acclimate to our temperatures. And that's just checking skin temperature, nothing else. No, it's deep skin temperature, so not superficial. But if you rubbed your neck, for instance, 
it can change it because rubbing your neck will actually cause inflammation, which is under the skin, not on top of the skin. So we have a pre rest. So you have to extrapolate from that to the subluxation. There's a there's not a direct connection. Somehow there is with the nervous system. Your um, the the temperature offset is leading you to think that there's a subluxation. Right, but that's why we have pattern analysis, which helps us, helps us determine that. So there's stress scans, adaptive scans, pattern scans. There's non-stress scans. This is where becoming a doctor and putting your doctor hat on helps. So a lot of, you're not just scanning like, oh, it's squiggly, let's adjust you. You're scanning and going, oh, you're in pattern, so I'm going to adjust you because you look like the pattern analysis we've been doing for the last few weeks. But ultimately, you place more, uh, it's kind of a balance between what you feel, right, and what that the line shows, or how do you, you don't feel anything. <laughs> Where do you put more uh, emphasis on the technology? Yeah. It takes us out of the equation, right? Because we're, we're subjective. Technology is objective. Objectivity is our goal. Yeah, I, I, I thought that was the case, and then somebody told me that the research shows 50% of the time it doesn't somebody. work. Somebody. Because uh, uh, CBP doc. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. You could just stop right there. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering, do you notice any differences when you're scanning between, say, an acute um, process and a chronic process? Because obviously the inflammatory processes are different. Yeah, for sure, because inflammation can cause stress scans. Right. So how do we differentiate? Well, that also ends up being acute or symptomatic care and not symptomatic care. Sure. Uh, so it depends on if they're a new patient or an old patient. Mm -hmm. And then that also, if they change the pattern, means that we would do new x-rays, which might mean that I have a new listing. Okay. So... Yeah, doctor hat. Um, but we do have people who come in a car accident, after a car accident, and we've been seeing them for quite a while. They might be in an acute phase, like their neck stiff, right? But we'll scan them, and they're still in the old pattern, so we know that we can still use the same listing. Okay. And it typically takes care of it. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about what the pattern means? Like, I was explained that the body's supposed to be, like, constantly moving and in flux, and if you're in pattern, that means that like you're stuck in a position, your body can't adapt to it. Is you that did great. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, your body's dynamic, right? You're constantly changing with the environment, you're adaptive. When that bone is out of place, and not allowing the brainstem to function properly, you're gonna get stuck in a physiological pattern. And that's gonna cause your body not to be able to adapt to the environment. And that's where the scan comes in. If you're stuck, we know to adjust. And by stuck, I don't mean the bone stuck necessarily. I'm just saying you were stuck in that pattern. Yeah. And that's why BJ Palmer, anyone read volume 18? Okay. All of you should raise your hand at some point after I say that. Maybe next time I'm here, you guys read volume 18. Yeah, it's fucking awesome. It's like our upper cervical Bible, right? But Dr. Palmer, BJ Palmer, talked about how people are subluxated at different times of days different times of the day. So when he saw a client, he liked to see you at the same time of the day because of that reason. So, can you explain a little bit about as to why static x-rays are reliable in getting into the same? Yeah, so why we use static x-rays in kale analysis and like BJ Palmer analysis um, is because we're basing everything off the frame and magnum. And what comes through the frame and magnum? <laughs> Brainstem, inferior part of the brainstem, be technical. So inferior part of the brainstem comes through the frame magnum. We're gonna uh, measure how far in the bone is to the frame and magnum and how much is twisted according to it as well. So we use static x-rays for that so we can actually measure it specifically. And then we can retake those x-rays, let's say the next day we've adjusted them or not and get the same listing. Since we are dynamic individuals, if you're doing more of like motion kind of x-rays, then things can change day to day. Or you might have an anomaly. Or maybe you don't, don't move the head properly to get the, get the proper uh, x-ray. It's, so it's not exactly the same as before. So, so if after an adjustment, the patient starts holding, could you see structural changes in the listing? Yeah, totally. So when someone comes in and like we do a progress exam, sometimes we'll do new x-rays on a progress exam. And if they're holding, like I scan them, I always scan them first. If they're holding, I won't do their x-rays. 
is most likely whatever the listing is I find is not going to be the true listing, right? Because that's the listing of the bone of it sitting without the pressure on the brain stem. So we'll hold off. So you use uh, line drawings on your x-ray? We definitely use our line drawings on the x-ray. Uh, so we, we're able to quantify it as opposed to just eyeballing. Okay, well then I was gonna ask if you could speak on the difference between the orthogonal uh, upper cervical models and articular, because the chest is an articular yeah. technique. So where does the line drawing fit in on that? Yeah, so or, do you guys know much about orthogonal and articular? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so orthogonal is like nuca, uh, what else, AO. We're trying to find an absolute zero with orthogonal. Um, and in particular, we're looking at, like I said, interference on the frame of magnum or brainstem. So it's, it's two different ideas that one, I'm trying to do without, uh, I'm trying to be non-biased. <laughs> you guys can work with me on that it's one. Difficult. It's difficult. <laughs> it's really difficult. Um, with, artic or with an articular kind of process of looking at how the bone can move, we're okay with the head sitting off to one side. In fact, some people, let's talk about scoliosis. I do this almost every single time here. Let's talk about scoliosis. Why is there scoliosis most of the time? It's adaptive. Yeah, it's adaptive to what? Stress is on the body. Loud. I can't hear shit. C1 out of place at birth, maybe? Okay, C1 out of place at birth. That's a good one. What else? So what would happen if C1 is out of place? What would happen with your head? Yeah, it's going to tilt. And then what's the body going to try to do? Basically. Compensate to bring the eyes back to the horizon. Scoliosis, right? So it's actually doing neurologically is it's trying to correct it so the eyes are straight and then they can flow up and down beautifully, right? Sometimes you have an anomaly, which would be like a wedge defect or whatever. Well, maybe Nate made the wedge defect to make sure that the spinal cord is actually flowing properly. So there is no absolute zero. That's kind of my point. Your zero is different than your zero. And mm -hmm. your listing is always going to be different than your listing because it's like a thumbprint. Everyone has a different listing, right? We found that out today. You, all three of you, where's, where's David? Mm -hmm. The hell is that? Guy? <laughs> so three of them were here, or up in my office today, and they all have what? AI LA. Yeah, so everyone's left listing, but they're all completely different listings, right? Their scans look all completely different. But I don't care if his head's back to center. That's not objective to me, because I know that he can also change that just by changing his stance just a little bit. What I care about is the scan, and the scan's clear or not. That's more important to me than absolute zeros. In our particular model, we're going to look at x-ray is one, scan is one, and the adjustment is one. And that's it. I'm trying to not like step on too many toes. You did great. I'm trying to kind of... Okay. Yeah. Um, so, if you're actually looking at uh, the x-rays and your surfaces, uh, does that mean you're also working within the symmetry yeah. that makes every individual unique? Yes, yeah, so everyone's, everyone's different. You're looking at a completely different person every single time, which is kind of my point of saying there's no absolute zero. Your zero is different than everyone else's zero, right? So yeah, and sometimes condyles are twisted a little bit. You know, sometimes the lateral mass is higher on one side than the other side. And the knee chest allows you to work within that balance. Yeah, actually it gives you a, an idea of that you don't have to worry about it that much. That's what's kind of cool about the chest. So I don't really have to worry so much about a larger lateral mass than a smaller lateral mass, but it will be in my head and we'll take that into account, but it's not gonna be the one thing I'm gonna focus on. And so, like, where are the implications of that? And let's say a neighbor supplied or not said, where someone's adjusting your gout with the anchor x rays. Well, first of all, they're just adjusting fixation, correct? So they're not really adjusting and manipulating. I'm not talking crap, I'm just being honest, right? So let's talk about biomechanics of gaps. In fact, who was at my office recently? We just talked about this. You guys were also. What do you? Yes, sir. Amazing. The atlas has two wedges on it, right? So a wedge on right, wedge on left. If you bend your head to the left, where does the atlas want to go? Left. left. If I'm in a diversified world, 
and I bend your head to the right, I'm like, oh, it seems like, yeah, it might be moving there, right? I bend it to the left, I'm like, oh, it's definitely stuck. Which way should I take that atlas? Technically, I should take it on the right and push it to the left. By closing a wedge, you're just causing fixation even more. It doesn't mean it's stuck on that side to thrust on that side. Kind of get that? Whereas when you use an upper cervical technique, any upper cervical technique, what you're doing is putting the head in a neutral position so there is no wedge that we have to worry about. We're using a uh, shearing type of adjustment where you can push the bone to either side without any guarding from innate or any guarding from uh, the uh, closing down on the wedges. So what do you think about uh, upper cervical techniques that work with a safe for example, where like the AP rotation of the condyles. Mm -hmm. um, so you're working more with like lateral rotation. Yeah. What are your thoughts about that? Well, I'm not a Blair expert, so let's put that out there. Right? But if I was gonna do any other for circle, it'd be Blair. Because I think Blair is freaking rad. It's awesome. But they're using a toggle headpiece mm -hmm. and they're gonna be using more torque than we use. We don't use as much torque. We're trying to unlock a joint and move it not beyond its means, but right to center point, where they're gonna more spin the bone into center point. It's just a much different adjustment. Do I think it's awesome? Yeah, it's freaking rad. And you watch those guys do that, it's at the heart, right? Um, but it's still an articulate model. Can you do Blair on a, on a knee chest headpiece? Not very well. Because knee chest is like, you guys have been knee chested before, you will understand, like, you hear that bone move, right? And doing a blare with all that torque and trying to, it just doesn't work very well. Um, but that's why the headpiece is so important. You can get in, get out, let the knee take over and shear back into the position. Um, hold on, that's it. Yeah. Um, I know that some of the things that BJ said with like, pressure, like bone under pressure, like occlusion, those things aren't necessarily like the forerunner of what a subluxation causes. What other kind of things, like in volume 18, whether it be like certain x views or that model, don't really apply. So when reading it, you don't like assume that's like still the well, same. Well, volume 18, he proves that wrong. Oh, okay. Yeah. So and that, that's actually the merit system. Mm -hmm. Pressure on nerves. Every nerve goes to a certain <clears throat> part of the body, right? So he actually talks about that and he gets rid of it. He's like, yes, yeah, it's not true. Mm -hmm. um, there's that. I don't understand the question now. I was wondering, are there <laughs> other things like, so like the merit system is disproved in volume 18, are there other things that like DJ thought were the standard that you no longer yes. do? That yeah, like so his x-ray analysis in volume 18, we don't use anymore. Like kind of, he <laughs> threw it out a long time ago. He's using a, a the wedge analysis. <laughs> Uh, we don't use that. We use what he was using when he passed away. Um, he also uses TP contact. We use a posterior arch contact. And in doing so, with the TP contact, you use a really hard pisy because it's it's like nail and what hammer and nail, right? So we're contacting just the TP with a very little part of our hand that we can maneuver properly. We do a posterior arch where you can grip the whole atlas and move it with your hand and get a better set. Um, that's another one. That's kind of it. Okay. Um, I was also wondering, do you do um, different type of like patient education? Like, do you do lectures like once a month? If you, how do you? None of that. No. Uh, we we used we used to try to do that. Um, our community is very different than most communities. People just don't want to show up after hours to do that. Like, no one would show up. Uh, so we do, like I do one-on-one -on -one report findings. Mm -hmm. I don't do group report. Um, education kind of happens every visit because we talk about chiropractic pretty much the whole time. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty nonchalant with my education, but people get it. And it's just kind of my personality. Yeah, but I don't like standing in front of uh, a big group of <laughs> potential patients and try to sell them a chiropractic. I think you're going to sell someone a chiropractic when they See the scan and see the change. 